Hello. In this presentation, we will be introducing the precision time protocol as it is implemented in the CX switch family. For that purpose, we will cover the following topics. We'll start with an overview. We'll cover the clock hierarchy and port roles and how that is established. Then we will take a look at the time synchronization mechanism provided by PTP. Then we'll look at PTP profiles in the PTP support on CX. So which platform support what uh, modes of PTP. Then we'll get into the deployment models and some recommendations. And we'll get into configuration, boundary clock configuration, and then transparent clock configuration. Next, we will take a look into some uh, few details on how to optimize the PTP behavior and performance in the network. And um, we'll take a look at PTP over splitter cables. Finally, we will have a quick demo and we'll get into troubleshooting. Let's start with a quick overview of the precision time protocol. The first thing is to define it. And um, it is a protocol that is used to synchronize clocks throughout the computer network. And by the way, we're using here a definition that I found in Wikipedia, which is pretty good because it gives us enough detail to understand uh, what precision time protocol is about. If you run PTP on a local area network, it will allow you to get a clock accuracy in the sub-microsecond range. So uh, it, al it will allow you to use it in uh, measurement systems, control systems, etc. It is employed to synchronize applications like financial transactions, mobile phone tower transmissions, acoustic arrays, and satellite navigation signal. The standard that we will be referring to here as PTP is the IEEE 1588-2008. It's also known as PTP version two. And by the way, it is not backward compatible with the original 2002 version. One of the good things that was introduced in the 2008 version in version two of PTP is the concept of a profile. A profile is a set of parameters and default values that uh, in, in parameter ranges that uh, allow you to tailor PTP in particular for certain industries or for different industries. What that means is that different, you can use PTP in different contexts for different applications, different industries. Uh, and instead of having to modify the protocol, what you need to know is what are the values that you use to adjust uh, the performance in the, the behavior of PTP. And you do that through profiles. So uh, different groups of engineers, like uh, different engineering associations, et cetera, create these profiles that are specific to their own industry and they test them and they verify that these are the, um, the optimal configurations for PTP. Um, there have been profiles defined for applications for telecommunications, electric power distribution, audiovisual, television, etc. In addition to all of this, there's a um, an adaptation of PTP called IEEE 802.1 AS, also known as audio video bridging or AVB. And uh, we will not get into this as we do not support uh, 1S today. There are some examples of uh, industries that have adopted PTP and that have created their, um, their profiles, et cetera, in that are um, have successfully implemented PTP in for their own applications. The first one here on the top left is the Society for Motion Pictures and Television Engineers. And uh, if you're interested in that particular implementation, 
of PTP. You can read the paper uh, for which you have the link here called Precision Time Protocol for Synchronization and Broadcast over IP. And this is specific to broadcasting uh, television and um, also for recording and uh, filming in digital media. So, uh, and across a digital network. The next example here has to do with audio engineering. And it's basically uh, thought as a standard and a way to implement PTP in a recording studio. And if you look at these two examples, you can think that it makes sense that you need a very high precision and very um, fine accuracy, both when you have to combine multiple cameras and microphones that are being coordinated and managed to uh, be able to broadcast a certain event, for example, a, um, a live program in a television studio or a, um, I don't know, a football game uh, in a stadium, etc. you can imagine that there is a very, very um, strict need for precision in the synchronization of all those devices, but not just among cameras, but also among those devices and applications that manage those cameras, that monitor those cameras, etc. And the same thing happens in a recording studio. Imagine that you have a large group of instruments that are played and you have all these microphones there. You might, will need all these microphones and the, the signal from all these microphones to arrive at the recording um, device in the exact, uh, with exact synchronized time. Otherwise, uh, the sound will not be natural. And uh, finally, here in the industrial automation, uh, you have here the picture does not match with the description here, but you can imagine in both cases. So the description here talks about a newspaper printing um, machine. And in that printer, you need to have uh, the, the whole system synchronized within uh, five microseconds to ensure that all the color pixels in the different cylinders uh, are um, will print in the right place and they will uh, hit the paper at the right time. So this synchronization is extremely necessary for that, you know, a the printing of that paper to be successful and not to be all smeared over the paper. Now, when we talk about accuracy, and that is when PTP is necessary and NTP, our good old network uh, time protocol is not enough. Um, and here's where you have a comparison, you have different things to compare here, but the most important part of it is the accuracy that I have highlighted. If you look at NTP, you have an accuracy that goes around one to a hundred milliseconds. But if you go to PTP, the goal is to get to under a hundred nanoseconds. And um, and it can go up to one microsecond. So you are a thousand times more precise, at least that with NTP. And if you want to compare those values, you can see down here in this table that if you're talking about um, 100 nanoseconds here, here in the uh, 10 minus seven. And when you're talking about 100 milliseconds, you are around uh, 10, um, you know, uh, one decisecond. So you see that this is a completely different level of accuracy. When we talk about messages, um, PTP is a protocol, as the name implies, and it uses messages to exchange information. And there are two 
large groups of messages, general messages and event messages. Event messages are basically to synchronize clocks. And um, you'll see that there are also general messages that participate in the synchronization mechanism. Uh, so you'll see in the next slide, the different other messages uh, one by one. And some of them will be general, some of them will be event messages. But we can distinguish those messages that we use to synchronize clocks and the ones that you, we use to establish the PTP network itself. And uh, you'll see what we mean by that when we get to building the PTP hierarchy. Uh, in terms of event messages, event messages have a critical timestamp. And the way you distinguish between general and event messages is by looking at the UDP port. In one case, it's 320, and the other one is in it's the number 319. So um, you have all these messages that you want to transport across your network that you need your sources, your source clock, and your receiving clocks to be uh, exchanging these messages. Uh, but you need to define on top of which protocol you will be um, transporting or what will be your the protocol that transports these messages. And these the options you have are basically three. You have IPv4 multicast, IPv4 unicast, or Ethernet. Today, we do not support IPv6. However, if in the future we do, the IPv6 implementation will also offer multicast and unicast options. In multicast, the source will send a multicast message, and that makes it a very efficient way of distributing information across a network, especially if you have a hierarchical network, because you send the packet from the source and it gets to all the destinations at once. And um, so the only thing that you have to be careful uh, for this to work properly is that your multicast routing is properly configured and that um, multicast is working fine across your network. If you use IPv4 multicast, it's apparently simpler to configure because you don't need all the multicast routing. However, the problem you have is that you have to configure on uh, you know, all the peer IP addresses for each one of the PTP nodes. And the issue that you can see there is that instead of sending one packet for one synchronization uh, within each synchronization period, you will have to send one synchronization packet uh, per peer because you're using unicast. So the CPU will be um, will be forced to work a lot more depending on the number of destinations that you have for each one of those packets. So this is why IPv4 multicast is usually the uh, mechanism that you would use. You can also use Ethernet. Um, and you will see that there are certain times in which just using Ethernet uh, to transport your packets is okay. And um, so, of course, you can have IPv4 multicast over Ethernet or, or any other layer to the network. So, PTP messages, the different groups. The top three here have to do with uh, building and maintaining the hierarchy of the PTP network. And um, it will allow clocks that need to get synchronized to decide which one is their best source, etc. And that will come through the announce uh, messages. So sources will send out announce messages with parameters that describe that uh, clock as a source and as the, the quality of the source, et cetera. And then that will be used if a certain receiver gets more than one announce or an announce from more than one source, it will be able to compare and make a decision on which source it will select. So that's the first part. The second part, and we can divide this into two also, is the first three, or sorry, the first four packets or messages uh, starting with sync, follow up, 
delayed request and delayed response. And these four are the normal uh, packet types or messages that you will use in a synchronization process. And we will go through the details of those uh, messages and how they participate in the synchronization mechanism uh, in the next few sections. There's also an alternative mechanism. You see that there's here a two messages called delayed request and delayed response, but there's also a uh, peer delay request, peer delay response, and peer delay follow-up messages. So the difference between the first two and this, the last three is that the delay request and response participate or exist when you have an end-to-end -end delay mechanism. And you'll see what we mean by delay and why do you need that mechanism. And there's also a peer delay mechanism that uh, can be implemented in a network. Peer, the peer delay mechanism is still not available in CX 10.10, um, but it's an interesting um, mechanism. It's interesting enough. So we will slightly cover that when we get to that section in the presentation. We have just seen our overview, so let's get started with the uh, the first part of a of the PTP process, and it has to do with the clock hierarchy and how the synchronization information will flow across the PTP network. First. To understand all of this, we need to define the different types of clocks that we have in PTP. Uh, you'll have sources and sinks, and we'll get to that in a minute. But you imagine here we're looking at this from the point of view of the clocks in uh, what they are, what's their quality, and um, what is what are their capabilities, and also how they fit into the clock hierarchy. The first one is the grand source clock. A grand source clock is a high precision clock that acts as the main source of synchronization for the network. It is not a network device. It is a third party device that connects to the network on one side, but usually on the other side, this grand source clock will receive and will get synchronized with a the GPS network and or other uh, very high quality sources. The key to the grand source clock is that you will uh, use it to inject um, synchronization information into your network. And it has to do a very high quality, uh, highly accurate clock. The second type is a boundary clock. Boundary clock is a device that can act as a sync or a receiver uh, for PTP uh, messages coming from upstream clocks, for example, from a grant source um, or from another boundary clock. It, when it receives the information, the synchronization information, it uses it to synchronize its own clock, um, of course, based on those PTP packets and that PTP mechanism with the source. And then when its own clock is synchronized, it will send out um, information for synchronization of the downstream devices. So it will be the receiver on one side and the provider or the source on the other side of that device. So it terminates a PTP conversation on one side and another PTP conversation on the other side and with different roles on each side. A transparent clock is an intermediate device. It's also a switch, like the boundary clock is also a switch. So these two are switches basically. In the intermediate uh, transparent clock, it is a device that is time aware, but does not have the clock quality uh, 
uh, and accuracy that is required to become a boundary clock. So it does not participate in the PTP conversation other than uh, modifying PTP messages that go across that device by adding a timestamp that represents the time that it took for that message to cross that particular device. That is called the resident time. And so it receives a PTP synchronization message from an upstream PTP device, either a boundary clock or a grand source clock. And it will add a second timestamp that is the resident time. That it's the time that it took for that switch to receive the packet and to be able to transmit it at the other port. And uh, finally, it transmits the PTP synchronization messages with that resident time uh, timestamp on it to the downstream PTP devices. Finally, we have the ordinary clocks. And you can think of the ordinary clocks as the clients, those devices that need to receive or that need to be synchronized among them into the uh, universal sources like the GPS network. So this is the actual application and it can be, so we think of them as PTP clients, but they're not necessarily clients. They could be uh, server or control systems and devices like uh, robots on the other side. And uh, so all those devices that need to be synchronized because they are the actual application uh, for that particular industry are the ordinary clocks. So the ordinary clock is embedded in a device uh, that needs to be in sync with the reference clock and other components of a particular system. As you saw, we have devices that are as sources, other ones that are as sinks or receivers. And be aware that we have this small uh, language issue here in which we have sync packets and uh, from the synchronization packets in the sync as the receivers uh, that is a role of a port. So you have ports in your network that act as sources and other ones at, at, that act as sinks for the PTP packets. So the source will transmit the packets, the sinks will receive the packets, especially here in terms of Think of this as announce and sync packets, right? There are other packets that can go from the sinks to the port, to the sources. Now, the sources will send announce packets down to the sinks to establish the hierarchy and to present themselves as source candidates. And the sync ports will receive those announce packets and will be uh, will select the actual uh, source if they have more than one candidate. And that's for the hierarchy. From the synchronization point of view, you have the synchronization packets or sinks that will go from the source to the sinks. And um, they will transport the timestamps from the source and the sink will take those timestamps and will um, synchronize their own clocks where adjust the clocks uh, to be uh, properly synchronized and accurately synchronized. So you see here this hierarchy goes from source to sync uh, and then source to sync, source to sync, et cetera. But this is an ideal network. Uh, we have here sinks and sources at each level. And we said in the previous slide that that means that these are boundary clocks. So each one of the, the switches in this network can act as boundary clocks. And that's not always the case. You will see later that uh, you will have some hierarchies in which you have only two uh, boundary clocks here at the top and all the others are transparent clocks. And there's also the alternative of having a couple of boundary clocks and then all the others are not um, PTP aware devices. And uh, I have seen that in many cases. And uh, in that case, you're sacrificing a, the level of accuracy that you get from the synchronization process because you have intermediate devices that do not provide the resident time that we just mentioned. But 
you get your PTP network at a much lower cost. So this is a uh, these are choices that a uh, an implementer has when um, it, he or she decides on how much money they can invest and what the hierarchy will look like. So remember, not all the devices need to be uh, PTP aware, but ideally they should. So in the best world possible, all the devices would be boundary clocked. In a not so ideal, they will be um, one layer of uh, boundary clocks and one or more layers of transparent clocks. And in a network that doesn't require that much precision, then, um, but it's, it still requires something better than NTP, you might have only a pair of boundary clocks. Let's keep going with this. Um, let's go through some of the details. We talked about the PTP grand source clock and the grand source clock is a, um, a device, a third party device that injects uh, synchronization information into the network. And it has a very uh, precise, a highly precise clock uh, in itself, but it is also synchronized uh, usually via GPS to uh, the universal timing service. So we said it has a high precision clock. It acts as the main clock synchronization source for the network. It's a third party device. It's not a switch. And it is the root of the PTP clock hierarchy. For redundancy, it is usually recommended to have two grand source clocks. And then um, the, the first level of boundary clocks will select one of them as the source and the other one will remain there as an alternative or backup clock. And you'll see that the quality of these clocks is defined by three, um, three values, class, accuracy, and variance. We'll not spend too much time on that here. Um, I recommend that you do some research on that if you're looking for a grand source clock. There are many vendors out there that have very good clocks and uh, in different price ranges. So, um, that's up to the customer to decide which one of these clocks they actually need. And it will depend on the industry, it will depend on the cost range, etc. Boundary clocks. This is where we as network uh, professionals start um, looking into our own devices. This is a switch and the boundary clock is a switch with a special characteristic. It has more than a normal clock in a switch. And we'll get into that detail in the next slide. But it is the sync for PTP upstream clocks. And um, it will receive clocking information from a source and it will synchronize its own clock to that information and then it will use its own clock to become the source for other devices uh, downstream in the network. In our case, this is a CX switch and uh, we'll give you a support table later and we'll see which uh, of the CX uh, devices or switch series support PTP boundary clock and uh, ideally, all the devices between the grand sources and the ordinary clocks should be boundary clocks. However, that is, as we mentioned earlier, that is not um, always the case. We'll have some PTP deployment models later and uh, we will be able to uh, make some distinctions on the best ways of deploying a PTP um, hierarchy in your network. So this is a very simple diagram of one of our uh, boundary clock switches. Uh, 
and or boundary clock uh, capable switches. And as you can see here, you have the ASIC, you have the CPU that runs the PTP software stack. Then you have a PTP clock and you have a crystal oscillator here that uh, provides the precision to the clock. So here, this combination of the temperature compensated crystal oscillator and the PTP clock are the ones that make this a uh, boundary clock uh, capable device. So how does this work? Suppose that you receive an event message, for example, a sync message on one of the ports and the uh, PTP carries a timestamp of when it was transmitted and it will, so you will be recording here also the, uh, the, the arrival time. So the packet now has two uh, timestamps, the departure time and the arrival time. So the packet with those two stamps is sent up to the CPU for the PTP software stack to take care of it. Um, the, the software stack takes the timing information uh, and parses it from the packet. It sends adjustment instructions to the PTP clock and to the ASIC. So it will adjust the time of the PTP clock and the uh, ASIC. So the PTP clock will adjust its frequency offset and um, it will, uh, the ASIC will update its time and date. So the timestamp information is updated on the ASIC. So that adjusts both clocks. So the clock, the ex, you know, the specific device that is a clock inside the switch plus the ASIC, they will have, uh, they will be synchronized in time. Finally, um, the timestamp information is going to be used to update uh, egress messages before being transmitted. So now when this device is a source, it will be able to timestamp very accurately the uh, sync messages that it sends out. This can also be the other way. This could be the transmission here could be a delayed request, uh, but you know, those are details you will be you can combine this with the mechanism that we will see later. So by default, all the ports that have been PTP enabled are going to be sources in a boundary clock. So when you just configure your switch and enable your PTP port, and you will see the, how you do that later, uh, you'll see that there are no PTP parents. That means that no source has been identified by the switch and selected as a parent, so as the main source for the synchronization process. So because that is the case, all the ports act now as clock sources. So they are all using the switch's internal clock and oscillator to uh, be as precise as they can and will be providing and sending out sync packets and announce packets. Now, as you can see, there's no announce and sync packets arriving at this device. But let's see what happens when we start receiving those kinds of packets. So suppose that you have a source block, could be a grand source or another uh, boundary clock, and we receive on port one a PTP announce and sync packet. So one or the other. The announce packet will have all the information necessary for our switch to decide which one is going to be its designated parent or the source. So now if we do a show PTP parent, we will see that there's the MAC address of the source clock uh, as the identity of this um, device. So now we do have a parent clock. And 
Uh, if you look at the interface state, you will see that uh, this part has become a sink and that all the others remain as sources. So a switch will have a single sink when it is working as a boundary clock. Now, suppose that you have more than one source sending announced packets to your switch and uh, your switch is receiving those announced packets on different ports or on the same port because there's an intermediate device that combines those two uh, packets, the switch will have to select which one of these sources it is going to accept and adopt as a parent. So there's a best source clock algorithm and the algorithm is based on several parameters. So it, it will start by looking at the priority one value, then the class, the accuracy, the variance, the priority two and the unique identifier. Now, class accuracy and variances are um, configured into the system by the manufacturer. So that is a representation of the clock's quality. The priority one and priority two parameters are manually configured and by default, the value is 128, but it can go from zero to 255. So you can uh, manipulate either priority one or priority two, depending on uh, when you want to influence the selection of the source or the parent. And uh, if you want to do that, absolutely, you do that with priority one. And if you just want to decide between two equally um, or two clocks with equal quality, you do that with priority two. And then if all everything is the same, so by default, uh, if you have two sources of the same quality, um, and you can see the quality here. This is a show PTP clock, and this is the quality, or these are the quality parameters that uh, we have in our 8360 switches. Um, so you have the class and the accuracy right here, the clock identity, uh, and the two default priority values. And so if you haven't used any of these parameters, they're all the same. The unique identifier, basically the MAC address of your sources is going to be used as a tiebreaker for that selection. So the clock identity, in this case, suppose that we're, this source one is an 8360, this is the profile that it will send down uh, in the uh, packets, in the um, announced packets. So, with that, we have our description of the, the clock types, uh, the hierarchy, et cetera. So let's finish this part here and let's start with the next section. In the previous section, we saw how uh, the, the different clocks talk to each other using basically announced packets to build a PTP hierarchy in the network. So they will define who's going to be the source for the, the rest of the devices. So we, it will build the hierarchy of uh, sources and sinks from the grand source clock all the way down to the ordinary clocks. Now that we have the hierarchy, we want to see how that hierarchy is used. So what is the time synchronization mechanism that we use in PTP to um, provide that uh, time accuracy and uh, synchronization across all the ordinary clocks, which is the final uh, purpose of PTP. Let's take first a look at the overall mechanism. In the overall mechanism, let's look just at as a time source and a time sink. So two ports, maybe directly connected or not. There might be a another device in between, uh, and we'll see what happens if that intermediate device is a transparent clock a little later. But let's take a look at this uh, in its basic components: a source and a sink. 
So the first thing that you need to notice here is that there are four packets here, the sync packet, the follow-up, the delayed request, and the delayed response. However, the follow-up packet is optional. So when you start configuring PTP, um, you will be asked if you want a two-step or a one-step mechanism. The difference is that who uh, transports the, the timestamp for T1. So let's take a look at this. The time source sends a sync packet or a synchronization packet to the time sync. And of course, there's a delay here for a, you know, the, the transit time for that packet to go from the time source one to the, from the time source to the same. So there's a difference between time, uh, time two or time T2 and time T1. The question is, if we have a one step, this timestamp, including T1 will come in the sync packet. But if we select to use a two step mechanism, the timestamp for T1 will come in the follow up packet. Um, the, of course, it is more precise to use a follow-up packet, but it might not be necessary in some cases. So you can choose uh, by default, the recommendation is if you can use follow-up, that will give you a better uh, accuracy, but it's not a critical difference. So you have to look at the, the different profiles and the different industries to make that decision. Uh, if you're using the default profile, we'll talk about that later, Use follow-ups if, uh, if it's possible, if it's available on all the clocks in your network, and that will allow you to have the best mechanism possible. Now, um, so we have the sync packet. Now the time sync or the receiver, the device that needs to synchronize its own clock to the source, uh, it will compute the receiving time from the transmitting time of that sync packet and it will um, have that ready for the computation of the offset. Now, I just mentioned the offset and you can look at the offset here at the bottom right, but the offset is the difference between the source and the sync clocks, that the offset is exactly what we want to find. The final calculation that we need out of the synchronization process by the time sync is the offset because the offset is the amount of the correction that we need on the time sinks clock, right? So the offset is the purpose of the process. Now, we need to calculate this delay, right? There's a, probably a delay here in the whole computation. So what we do is to provide more precision to uh, than just uh, using the uh, the difference between T2 and T1, we want to calculate the delay. And of course, the delay will be low probably if you have a uh, direct link, but if you have intermediate de devices, it can be larger. So the purpose is to try to calculate the delay between the two devices. And with that delay, um, what we basically do is we adjust the um, the offset, right? So the time sync will send a delayed request with the T3 timestamp to the time source. The time source will uh, know T4, so the time at which it receives the delayed request, it will send a delayed response. And the delayed response will include these two timestamps. Right, so it is a um, it does not have a timestamp itself. It's not an event message, but it will contain critical information, which is T uh, four minus T three. So now we have uh, the the path delay will be T two minus T one. So the delay here, the first delay, uh, plus the second delay, which is the delay that we use with the delay request and response that we calculated there. And we take the average of those two. 
And then because we take the average of those two, we have a better calculation of the delay. So the offset will be the difference between T2 and T1 minus the mean path delay. And that is how the time sync uh, device or the sync device will uh, calculate its offset and adjust its own clock. Again, quickly, we have the sync packet. And so the time sync will know uh, T2 and T1. So the reception of the sync packet and the transmission of the sync packet. And that is one part of the calculation. The other part is the delay request. When we send it, when it was received at the source, and we will get that information in the delay response. And so we have two delays that we use uh, to uh, have a better um, approximation of the actual delay. So with that, we take the average of those two and we use that to uh, calculate the mean path delay. And the offset will be T2 minus C1 minus the delay that we calculate. So that is how you get the micro adjustment to your clock. Now that um, has to do with direct connections between a source and a sink. And um, we haven't checked about anything that is in between those two devices. If there's nothing or, or you know, it's just a cable between the two devices, it's one thing, but suppose that uh, you have a non-PTP uh, a wear switch in between, it will work the same. However, if you have a transparent block, you will get a better result uh, in the delay calculation and in all these um, numbers, T1, T2, T3, and T4 that we saw in the previous slide. And um, then you get, if you have a non-PTP aware device in between. So a transparent clock provides a good solution when you cannot have boundary clocks on every step. So it's an intermediate device. that is neither a sink nor a source. So it does not receive uh, announce and um, and sync packets in the sense that it does not receive and processes and process them, it will receive them just to transmit them. But when it transmits them, it adds a new timestamp with the resident time. So it will use the time that it took for that packet to go across the transparent clock. So between the um, the ingress and the egress ports, it will add that timestamp. Uh, to the packet. So the message will now, the, let's say a sync message, will now include T1 plus the resident time. So when it arrives at the sync, it will have two stamp, timestamps instead of one. And now you have three um, pieces of information, T2, the receiving time, the resident time, and the transmission time of that message. Now for the delay mechanism, you have two options. You have an end-to-end -end delay, and this is what we will be uh, looking into uh, in the next three slides. So the correction here is what we just mentioned, the resident time. Um, and this end-to-end -end delay is today supported on both the 8360 and the 6300 switches when they act as transparent clocks. And you have the peer-to-peer -peer delay, which uh, instead of doing the, the delay request going end-to-end, -end, it means from the sink to the source, the transparent clocks participate in the delay calculation. And we'll get back to that later. Uh, we'll have one slide to illustrate the difference between the two mechanisms, but just be aware that today we only support end-to-end -end delay. So we'll focus on that. What we said here is the difference between boundary clocks and uh, transparent clocks. In a boundary clock, 
the synchronization mechanism goes between a source and a boundary clock first. Then there's the, the clock within the boundary clock device, and uh, it becomes the source of other syncs. So you have the sync mechanism has two steps, right? So each on each side, there's a different sync mechanism uh, in a different direction. In a transparent clock, remember the transparent clock is neither a source nor a sync, so it was then in between the source and the sync. So the sync package will go across the transparent clock and will reach the sync. But we will, as we mentioned earlier, we add the resident time um, as an additional timestamp. So that is the main difference. And you can see that this using boundary clocks may be more precise than just using transparent clocks. And of course, transparent clocks are still better than using a normal switch there that does not add the resident time because then you will be uh, less able to calculate the delay. So if you have an end-to-end -end transparent clock, what you have is that, at, and here we have two of them. We have a time source, transparent clock number one, transparent clock number two, and we have the sync packets will go across both transparent clocks, but you will get the resident time of each one of them in the either the sync packet or the follow-up packet to the sync. So the sync will get all of them and we'll be able to calculate the difference between T2 and T1, but it will also count the resident time into that calculation. Now, what happens with the, the delay mechanism? And here's where the end-to-end -end concept comes into play. So remember, it's the sync that sends the a delay request. It will go across all the transparent clocks to the source. The source will know T4, and then it will send the delay response across to the sync. And it will also add the resident times to that. Uh, so it will stamp the resident time into the delay response packet also. So this is the whole mechanism. As you can see, if you have a time source with many sinks, this time source will be processing many uh, delay requests. So that's where uh, this mechanism can be uh, not ideal for very large deployments. So this is what I was talking about. So suppose that you have here many um, ordinary clocks at the bottom. You have transparent clocks in between, and you have a, um, a boundary clock at the top. And the boundary clock will be receiving from the ordinary clocks the delay requests and will have to respond. So the more boundary clocks that you, uh, ordinary clocks that you have um, that are synced for that source, the CPU of the source or the boundary clock will get more and more requests. So as this grows, you may have a bottleneck in the CPU. And of course, uh, you can go to the, uh, the COP, the COPP and monitor that. We will get back to that later to see if your CPU is being uh, overloaded with delay requests. The alternative to this is to use the transparent clocks as an intermediate uh, delay calculation device. And that is called PTP, peer-to-peer um, -peer delay request uh, or delay mechanism. What happens here is that the transparent clocks send their own delay request to the boundary clock, to the source clock, right? And I mentioned this top device here as a boundary clock, but it can be the grand source. So in this case, you have four transparent clocks and the CPU will be receiving only four delay requests per synchronization period. Now that is okay because we have reduced all of these requests to only four. And then 
when the trans the ordinary clock send the request uh, for uh, the delayed requests, the transparent clock will add the delay between these two devices, but also they will add the delay that they calculated in the relationship with the source clock. So they will send down to the ordinary clock both delays, and uh, the ordinary clock will have the total delay uh, by having the components of each one of the steps, which is why it's called peer-to-peer. -peer. As you can see, this is more complicated in terms of the transparent clocks, but it reduces the demands on the CPU or the source clock. So this is a future feature that uh, we are planning to include into our PTP implementation. And I mention it there because that is might be one of the solutions that you have for uh, when you get to um, performance issues in your PTP network. Now we will take a look at the PTP profiles in general, those PTP profiles that are supported in CX and CX support in general for PTP. So we will take a look at the list of platforms that support PTP and what are the, uh, the modes in which PTP is supported on those platforms. So let's start with PTP profiles. We've already said that one of the most interesting aspects of uh, the IEEE 1588 version two um, standard is that it allows different industries to define something called a profile. And a profile is basically a set of PTP parameters, value ranges, and default value. As we said, uh, each profile will depend on the industry, application, and use case. So, each industry will use the profile uh, to adjust and to um, provide the users and the manufacturers of the devices that belong to that industry with the, the set of parameters and the value ranges and default values for that particular uh, industry and how they have been tested and uh, what is you know, the, the best recommendations for that particular industry and for those use cases. So those are the profiles. <clears throat> it's an excellent way to uh, keep using the same protocol across different industries with the best results possible for each one of those cases. In CX, in 10.10, .10, we support four profiles. There's a default profile called 1588 version two, which of course is the default um, profile that comes from the standard. And uh, we'll get to the values of this profile later. Then uh, we support the SMT ST 2059-2, which is the professional broadcasting um, environment uh, set of parameters or profile. And it was defined by the SMT, the Society for Motion Pictures and Television. Then from the Audio Engineering Society, uh, we incorporated the a AES67 profile. That is a the set of parameters that works best for audio over IP and audio over ethernet. <clears throat> and then there's the AES R16 profile, which is a combination of parameters for AES67 and SMT, um, ST2059-2. And so the this profile combines these two sets of parameters. Uh, so a system working with these profile can also offer the best service in terms of uh, television and motion pictures and also uh, so live systems and also the best audio possible. So it provides a good combination of audio and video um, parameters. So here in this table, you will see a set of parameters and you see that 
the announced interval, the sync interval, the delay request interval, the announced timeout, and the domain name or the domain number um, is defined in each one of these uh, profiles. So just notice that the domain, for example, for the sum t, the default domain is 127. In all of the other um, profiles, it's zero. And you can take a, your time and watch this if you need, uh, and you can find these parameters in uh, other documents across the internet. In terms of the, the CX support for PTP in 10.10. Here's a list of all the 8360 switches. Notice that all of them, except for two SKUs, which is the same model with front to back or back to front um, airflow, support both boundary clock and transparent clock. The JL706C and 707C and the previous versions of the same uh, devices do not support um, any type of PTP. And if you look closer, you will notice that uh, these two devices are the ones that have 48 um, copper ports plus 400 gig ports. So these are the ones that you have to be um, aware that do not support PTP at all. All the others can uh, function as boundary clocks and transparent clocks, one or the other. Remember, they you have to choose which one of these um, clock modes you want to uh, the device to provide. In terms of the 6300 switch series, uh, you see that there are only two models that um, support boundary clock mode. Um, and you see them here almost at the end of the list. And these are the two smart rate um, new models of the 6300 switch series. And all the 6300 support transparent clock mode, including these two. Now that we have seen the two most important uh, aspects of PTP itself, the um, uh, building of the PTP clock hierarchy in your network and the synchronization processes that PTP uses to get the uh, timing across the network synchronized, we can now take a look into how do we deploy, what are the recommended topologies and what other recommendations we need to take into account. First of all, let's take a look into some general guidelines and uh, we'll see some uh, three deployment models and uh, these guidelines also, they are the result of the testing done by the Aruba Network Testing Labs and our recommended designs and configurations. So uh, whenever you are designing your PTP network, pay attention to these four slides and the information in them. This is a very good reference for your uh, design and deployment. First of all, um, if you're using IP multicast as your transportation mode, then uh, use PIM sparse mode as your routing option. Uh, if you are connecting transparent clocks and boundary clocks, ensure that the transparent clocks become the DR by setting the DR priority on them. Ensure that the M routes are programmed on transparent clocks so that there is reachability for, for PTP streams from the upstream. And also configure static IGMP groups on transparent clocks in those cases in which the clients themselves cannot send IGMP joins uh, for the multi -P, uh, for the PTP multi multicast groups. So if you have clients or ordinary clocks that cannot generate the IGMP joins for PTP multicast groups, in those cases, you can configure 
uh, static IGMP groups on the transparent clocks. So that's in terms of IP multicast. In terms of QoS on the transparent clocks, and also on switches that are not uh, PTP are enabled or aware. The first thing is that the uh, most of the grand source clocks in the market in the 8360s and 6300s, when they behave as boundary clocks, so most of the sources in your network, and most probably all of them, will mark the PTP event messages that they are sending out with a DSCP value of 48. So in the next step downstream, for example, if you have a transparent clock or a non-PTP switch, configure QoS Trust DSCP to provide the right priority. So in the following deployment models, pay special attention to the nodes on multicast configuration. The first use case or the first recommended um, deployment model is a two tier with layer two access. In this case, let's take a look at the network. We have two uh, grand source clocks at the top uh, as the roots of the hierarchy. Then we have a pair of uh, core switches that behave as boundary clocks. Um, and this looks a lot like a simple uh, two tier campus network or a two tier data center network that uses uh, layer two access, so a layer two fabric in the data center. And um, in both cases, you have 8360s as boundary clocks at the top, at the core, and then the access, depending if you are talking about data center or campus, could be 8360s or 6300 switches working in transparent clock mode. Let's go through some details. The first thing is that in terms of the grand source clocks, you may want to use either priority one or if both uh, grand source clocks are identical, use priority two to determine which one is going to be the selected parent. So the active grand source clock for the network. If you do that, the second grand source clock will be there as a standby in case there's a failure in the connection between the grand source clock one in the core or in the grand source clock itself. Now, one of the main uh, caveats here is that VSX and PTP are mutually exclusive in uh, the, the current uh, CX 10.10 version or release. So in this particular deployment model, you need to enable spanning tree, especially if your core is a pair of 8360s. Remember that STP is disabled by default, so you just need to enable it. Second consideration here in terms of communication, if your downlinks are lax, uh, and we will see the details later, uh, but this is a checklist for you you need to define two of the ports on that link aggregation group as a primary role for PTP and secondary role for PTP respectively. So only two of the member ports of the link aggregation groups are going to be transporting PTP. One of them is going to be active and the second one is going to be the backup. Um, if you are using, because this is layer two, and we're talking about uh, a layer two link here between um, the core and the axis, you will most probably have several VLANs. So you have to des designate one of those VLANs as the PTP VLAN. So that is the VLAN that will transport your PTP packets. And of course, that VLAN needs to extend all the way from the boundary clock through the layer two access uh, transparent clock to the ordinary clock at the end of the tree. If um, 
you are using this dual connection from the access layer to the boundary clocks, then uh, along with the uh, spanning tree, you need to enable VRRP. And in that case, of course, the best combination is MSTP and VRRP. And so that will give you the right configuration for the redundancy in this environment. Multicast routing in this case is not necessary for PTP because the source port and the sync port are on the same subnet. So you may want to enable um, IGMP snooping on the layer two access switches, but it's not uh, critical. It's usually the optimal way of doing it and you can decide to take that into account. So let's take a look at the transparent clocks. The transparent clocks, if you are in a campus environment, will most probably be 6300 switches or a VRF stack of two or more of these devices and um, will be configured as transparent clock. But if, on the other hand, if we, this is a data center deployment and these are devices in the data center, these might also be 8360 switches working as transparent clocks. Uh, if these are 6300 switches, spanning tree is enabled by default, but you have to match the MSTP configuration that you have uh, at the core. The PTP VLAN is not required and cannot be configured on transparent clocks because the VLAN goes across the, the access switch because it's a layer two switch, there's no need to clarify that because the packets will come in and leave the switch on the same VLAN because there's no routing. On the VLANs carrying PTP, the best thing is to, or the recommended configuration is to enable IGMP snooping and to create a snooping static group for the 224.0.1.129 um, multicast address. So those are the recommendations for this deployment model. If you have the same thing, but you have a layer three access, in this case, um, some things are simpler and some things are a bit more complicated. So it's simpler because you don't need STP in this case, because all your communication between core and access is layer three. So you manage the redundant paths there um, with IP routing and there is no, there are no loops. Um, but in the layer three access, uh, you will need to have, if you're using transparent clocks in the layer three access, then you will need to enable PMSM routing on those devices. So the rest of the stuff is similar. Let's go uh, step by step. The cores, in this case, uh, we're looking at our 8360 switches behaving as boundary clocks. Uh, the considerations for the ground, the ground source clock uh, and to manipulate the, the priority one or two uh, is the same as before. It will have to be a PMSM router and it will become the BSR and RP candidate. Uh, using the loopback interfaces for those for that purpose. Uh, all PTP interfaces, uh, either routed only ports or SVIs, must be PMSM enabled. And uh, if the downlinks are link aggregation groups, remember that you have to configure uh, one of the links there as a uh, primary role for PTP and the second one as secondary and all of the others are going to be just uh, member ports but will not transport PTP information. On the layer three access devices that are behaving as transparent clocks, and again, here we're showing only 6300 switches, but these could also be 8360 switches. Um, you have to have PMSM uh, enabled and uh, on the PTP interfaces, you have also to enable IGMP querier, and if possible, um, also add the IP IGMP static group that we mentioned before. And on PTP SVIs, 
use IP PIM sparse DR priority 100 to make sure that the transparent blocks are the DRs for each one of the VMs. Finally, a three-tier network with layer three access. In this case, we're looking at all of the layers as 8360s, except for the, and this is what has been tested today. Um, very soon, the 6300 can also be part of this. But as you see, this looks more like a, a data center deployment in which you have spines and leaves. And um, so you will have between the grand source clocks and the network, you will have transparent clocks. And then the rest of the network, spines and leaves, are going to be boundary clocks. So don't pay too much attention to the topology here, because in this, in the testing, they connected the spines between them, but they can also be connected. Uh, the two, you know, each one of the leaves can be connected to both spines with no connection between the spines. And uh, this model would work exactly the same. From the PTP point of view, it will behave correctly also. So um, let's take a look at each one of these layers. First of all, at the top, connected to the grand source clocks, we have a pair of transparent clocks that could be 8360 or 6300 switches. Um, it will, so these devices will be PMSM routers. Uh, they will be VSRs or RP and RP candidates using our loopback interfaces. This is different from the previous model in which the boundary clock was the candidate both for VSR and RP. In this case, we're using those devices that are directly attached to the ground source clocks for that purpose. All PDP interfaces must be PMSM enabled, IGMP querier, and IP IGMP static groups of 224.01.129. And on the PTP links to the spines, also include the IP PIM sparse DR priority 100 for these transparent clocks to become the DRs. That is an important configuration and has been proved in the labs to be the uh, most efficient configuration for uh, whenever you have transparent clocks that are also routing. And of course, in all of these three models, we've been using the recommended transport option, which is IPv4 multicast. Spines, both boundary clocks, both 83 switches. We could also have here the 6300s that we, uh, the two models that support boundary clock mode, but because this is a data center um, deployment uh, from the topology that you see here, most probably you will not be uh, choosing 6300 switches for this purpose. It will, both spines and leaves are going to be 8360 switches. Um, they will be configured as boundary clocks. One of them will have a priority one uh, of 10. Actually, both of them can have that in this topology um, because they will be the sole, in this particular topology, They each spine will be the sole source for the, the next leaf. So again, if downlinks are link aggregation groups, remember about the PTP roles of primary and secondary, and also um, these uh, boundary clocks need to be PS, PMSM routers. The leaves, exactly the same configuration. There's no difference here between leaves and spines. The actual differences are have to do with the fabric itself and not with the PTP configuration on, on them. So as a uh, summary, we have three deployment models, uh, two that are two tiers, one of them with layer two axis, another one with layer three axis, and then a three tier that looks more like a data center um, deployment in which you have um, three tiers and all of them routing. 
With that, we have completed this section. Now let's take a look at the configuration of PTP in CX. We'll start with the boundary clock configuration and then we'll get into the configuration of a transparent clock. Here are the commands that you have at the global level. So when you configure PTP, you will configure a global PTP context, and then you will go uh, to each one of the interfaces in which uh, you will enable PTP mode and configure PTP on them. And um, so to start the configuration and enter PTP global context, you have to say PTP profile and select one of the four profiles that is available in CX 10.10. So when you get to the profile, inside the profile, you will configure all the global um, parameters. So the first one is the mode of the clock. So you have to decide if you are going to run this device in boundary clock mode or transparent clock mode. And again, this is a global, parameter, so it will apply to the whole uh, device. So a device is either a boundary clock or a transparent clock. It cannot be both uh, on some ports, one on some ports and one on another. It's all a single boundary or a single transparent mode clock. Uh, you see that there's also the end-to-end -end command there in the end-to-end -end, uh, parameter in the mode boundary is the, uh, will tell you how you will use the uh, the delay synchronization mechanism, which one of the two you can have. Here uh, in 10.10, 10, we only support end-to-end, -end, so you will always have to select that option. Then you select your transport protocol, and normally you will select between IPv4 and Ethernet. You don't have here an option to say IPv4 multicast or unicast, and we'll get into that later. So you select IPv4, for example, and by default, it will assume that you will be using multicast. Next, the other mandatory command is to select if you are going to be using two steps or one step for the synchronization of the clocks. And remember, two steps is the mode in which when the source sends the sync packet, it will also send a follow-up packet. If you're using a one-step option, the uh, T1 timestamp or the timestamp that represents when the sync packet was sent will be part of the, will go in the sync packet. So you have these two options. Normally the recommendation is use two steps unless the devices that you're using as your ordinary clocks or your grand source clocks do not support that. There are also some optional parameters here. You can change the priority one or priority two that in the default profile is 128. And um, the range goes from zero to 220 to 255. This is optional. You can leave the default and it will work fine. Um, here's an example of the command for priority one. Also, you can change the clock domain, but make sure that the clock domain is the same across your whole PTP network. So you will use the domain number if you have on the same network, you have two different PTP deployments, uh, for example, for two different purposes, so you will have different domains. Uh, remember that one switch can belong only to one domain. So if you have these two uh, coexisting uh, PTP deployments on the same network, you will have to have different boundary uh, clocks uh, or devices that behave as boundary clocks, they will have to be different. Um, and the last, thing that is also mandatory is to enable the profile. And that not only enables the profile, it actually enables PTP on the whole uh, set. So if in any circumstance, 
you do a show command and you see that it says that PTP is not enabled, go to the PTP profile context and enable it there. There's no external command to this context that will allow you to enable PTP. So remember, PTP on a certain switch, the, all the global configuration is done at the profile level. Now let's get into the interface and we'll, we'll be looking at two cases here, ports or link aggregation groups. So you get into the interface context and in um, the, the context, if this is a trunk port, a VLAN trunk port, you will have to select the VLAN that will transport PTP. So that's the PTP VLAN command. Um, optionally, you can modify the profile default settings. Remember, the profiles provided a set of uh, setting ranges and the default values for PTP. In general, it is not recommended to change those settings unless there's a recommendation by the uh, manufacturer of your ordinary clocks to do so. If you do so, make sure that you do use the same parameters across your whole PTP network. So now if you're using uh, as PTP transport IPv4, but you don't want to use multicast, you have to configure the peer IP address, which is obvious. If you are not using multicast, then you have to send unicast to specific peers. And in that case, uh, you need to know what those peers are. Then you enable PTP on the interface. Now, all of that is the same for both ports and lags. If you have a lag, then remember, you have to choose two ports in that lag that one of them will behave as the primary, so it will be transporting PTP packets, and a secondary one that will be the backup of the primary. Now, all the other link aggregation group ports will transport no PTP traffic at all. So you have a primary and a secondary, and these are your two. Uh, so that's your redundant pair of links in that link aggregation group that can handle PTP traffic. Here's a quick example. You have on the left, the PTP profile. Uh, in this case, we're using the default profile 1588 V2. Uh, we enable the profile. We have a two-step clock. Uh, we will use IPv4 multicast for transportation and uh, the boundary mode is going to, so, the clock mode is going to be boundary with end-to-end -end delay um, calculation. On routed only ports, the only thing you need to do is to enable PTP. And then on a VLAN trunk, in this case, what we are showing is we have two uh, uplinks with uh, on interfaces one and two that are connected to possible sources. And then we have a link aggregation groups that is connected downstream to um, different uh, transparent clocks. So in this case, so this looks a little bit like the first deployment model uh, in which we have layer two access with transparent clock modes and a core with uh, boundary clocks. So the interface link aggregation group here, notice that uh, it is in VLAN trunk mode and we are allowing VLAN 240, among others, you can have more here, but we need 240 because that is the one that we have designated in this example as the PTP VLAN. Um, then notice that we had, we, when we had layer two, links, we needed to have that VLAN, but also if we have a link aggregation group, we need to have the PTP link aggregation group roles. So we took two of the ports on that lag, uh, port three and four. One of them, we designated it as primary and the second one as secondary. 
one thing that we haven't mentioned before, but it's very important, is to use the loopback interface as the PTP source. So just the normal, typical IP source interface command will be used for that purpose. So this will make sure that your packets are identified by the loopback interface IP address, and also that you have redundancy in case one link goes down, you can still uh, reach the source of the PTP packets. In the configuration of uh, boundary clocks, there is one important aspect that is the clock source only port. Clock source only port is a new feature that came in 10.10, .10, and this is what it is all about. So the first thing is, uh, remember the process in which we uh, selected when we had many source candidates um, and we were receiving announce and sync packets from different sources on a the same on a single boundary clock, we would go through the whole uh, selection process, starting with priority one, the three uh, clock quality parameters, uh, priority two, and finally the MAC address. So you can see that here in this table. So you see show PTP four and clock sources, and that will tell you what all those sources are. And in this case, what we are seeing is that there is a clock here uh, on which the priority one parameter has been um, configured as 10, so it is a lot lower than the, the default value. And if this is actually a raw PTP source, so somebody is injecting PTP traffic that is not desired on the network, it will disrupt your whole PTP network by, um, set, you know, by the boundary clock selecting it as its actual source, its parent. So if you go to PTP parent, you will see that uh, the MAC address of this unwanted source clock has been selected. So, and that is because the priority was 10. So how do we prevent this from happening? Of course, not allowing other PTP devices to show up in the network, but that can happen also by mistake. So let's take a look at a very good um, prevention mechanism that is incorporated into CS. It is a very simple um, configuration. On those ports that are PTP enabled, but are going to stay as clock sources, so we do not want to be accepting announce and sync packets on those ports, we will run the command PTP clock source only. What will happen if you do that? Suppose that you have this rock PTP source clock here, what it will do when you have this, um, this parameter configured on that interface or interfaces, it will ignore and drop the announce sync and follow up packets that arrive there. So this is a very important feature and um, the configuration as you can see is straightforward. So you define your sync ports, so those ports on which you will accept source candidates, and you will select among them. And on those, you will only enable PTP among, if you want, you can have all the other parameters that we talked about. But in principle, you will define the sync ports by just enabling PTP. And on those devices that you won't accept, um, them becoming a sync or to have a source connect that we will enable the PTP clock source only uh, mode. And with that, we will stop accepting um, announce and uh, sync packets. So we have a test set up for this. We, we run a test and the this is the configuration that we use. We had a sync that was legal here, two sources that were legal connected to the 8360. And on port four of that device, we connected 
another port, another in a, that was a source. So we made the source with a lower priority than the other two sources. And this was what happened. So the initial state, remember by default, all the ports are, um, all ports that are PTP enabled are PTP sources. So now a, uh, we started the grand source clocks on the Excel testing device. And there was the uh, clock source selection there. And one of those, two ports, port one became the, the, the sync clock in or sync port, and port number two became a, again, a source clock because it was not acting as a sync and not receiving, but it was actually a standby for port one. So when you look at the port itself, it will tell you that the state is source, but um, it's not, um, acting as the as a source in reality, because at the other end of that you have the grand source clock, so you have another source. So now you start ordinary clocks, and the ordinary clocks will receive traffic from ports three and four. However, if the device on port four becomes a source and it starts sending announced packets with a priority of 10. So higher oh, yeah. than the priority being received on port one, the trend would be that, or the, the result would be that port four will select that source as the, the actual source for its clock. So it will start receiving the announce and sync packets on port four instead of port one which is what we actually want. So when we apply the clock source only a command on port four, what happens is that the announce sync and follow up packets are being dropped. And you can verify the protection by looking at the interface brief command, the parent command, and also looking at some statistics on that port. Talking about the statistics, this is what you will see you will see that in the discarded packets uh, column, you will start seeing announce and sync packets and follow up packets being discarded. Um, it will be sending these kinds of packets because it's a source port. So it remained as a source to receive some packets, it will send other packets. But notice that all the announced sync and follow up packets that were received were also discarded. So these numbers on the first column and the third column are the same. You can also take a look at the, um, the logs. And for that purpose, you have to go to the shell, run this particular command here and look at the announced packets. And you see that you'll start noticing these ignore announce packets uh, received on master only stream. This is source only port. So that concludes the bundle clock configuration. Remember, we can start by configuring the global um, settings in the profile um, context. So you go PTP profile, select the context and within that context where you will select all the global parameters. Then you would go to each one of the interfaces and configure enable PTP on those interfaces and if necessary, configure some of the parameters. In general, those parameters are going to be um, the default. So you won't have to change any one of those parameters. In addition, on those ports that will, you don't want to become sinks, you will add the uh, clock source only mode uh, command. So with that, we conclude this section. Now that we have seen the boundary clock configuration, let's take a look at the configuration of a transparent clock. And for this configuration, we will 
configure the end-to-end -end delay mechanism, which is the one that we support today. Again, uh, this is similar to the um, boundary clock configuration in the sense that you have a global context, which is the actual PTP profile context. And you have to select that context uh, in terms of the profile that you want to use. And then, so you configure the profile and finally you go to the actual interfaces that you will have and enable PTP on them. Um, remember that the interfaces are neither source nor sinks. So the only thing that you have to do is enable them to allow uh, the transparent clock mechanism to be applied to, applied to PTP traffic arriving and uh, being transmitted on those interfaces. So what can we configure at the global profile level? First of all, we select the profile. And once we get into the profile context, we will select the clock mode. In this case, transparent end-to-end -end, because it's the only option for transparent clock in 10.10. .10. Then we will select the transport protocol, IPv4 in general, it can be ethernet also in some cases, but in general, we'll say IPv4. And this of course needs to be consistent with all the, the rest of the clocks in the PTP network. Then the clock step, this is a strange one because the uh, only option you have here is one step. But remember that when we configure the boundary clock, we recommend it to use two steps. And the two step mechanism was the one that used the follow up messages right after the sync message. So uh, with one step, we do not have that. However, um, if you select one step here, you don't have a problem with having selected the two-step mechanism, which is the one recommended on the boundary clock, because the boundary clock will be the one, um, you know, owning that communication. So this one-step configuration here will be ignored. So don't worry about this. Select the only option you have, and it will work even if you have a two-step option on the boundary clock. The clock domain, this is optional. You can use the default uh, that is zero, but it will depend on the profile. And finally, enable the profile. Um, just the clock domain, once more, remember that it has to be the same end-to-end -end on, uh, on your network for that particular PTP uh, process. So, or that particular as the name implies, the particular PTP domain. So all the devices that will be in that hierarchy that starts at the uh, grand source clock or pair of clocks uh, will be within one domain. On the same network, you can have another domain, but the uh, boundary clocks and transparent clocks can belong to only one domain. So you may have other devices that belong to a different domain for a different purpose on the same network, but they do not overlap. Here's a short example. You see that the configuration is very simple. Um, on the left at the top, you have the PTP profile. In this case, the default profile 1588 version two. Um, we enable the profile. We select the only option we have for the clock step. We select IPv4 as the transport protocol. And then uh, we use a transparent mode with end-to-end -end delay mechanism or delay synchronization. Um, in the interface lag, we just enable PTP. Uh, and here we don't have to decide which ports are the primary and secondary ports for that lag, because that doesn't apply to this case. And we don't have to configure the PTP VLAN either, because all of that is part of the, the domain, the boundary clock configuration, and the transparent clock will uh, just accept whatever comes from the boundary clock, from the sources. So the only next step is if you have a lag, or individual ports to enable PTP on those ports. In this case, 
uh, in this example, the lag is the uplink connected to the boundary clock, which is a, an 8360 switch. And on the right side, you have two ports that are connected to a, a two different ordinary clocks. So we have PTP enabled on those ports. And that's all, that's the simple configuration that we need on a uh, transparent clock that can be either a 6300 switch or an 8360 switch. Now let's take a look at how to optimize PTP. Let's start with the um, boundary clock and let's see what we need to do here. The first thing to monitor is to make sure that we're not dropping packets that are destined to the CPU of the switch running the boundary clock. You can do that by uh, looking at the COPP statistics for the class PTP. By default, the values that you have for this particular class in the control plane policy um, is the priority for those packets is going to be pretty high, priority five, with a rate of a thousand packets per second allowed and also a burst size of 250. So that will show you that uh, these parameters are very reasonable in terms of the um, the traffic destined to the CPU. And remember, this is a boundary clock, so traffic coming from sources in sinks will get to the CPU. And in particular, sinks connected to this boundary clock will be sending the delay request packets that will have to be processed by the uh, CPU. So if you start seeing packets dropped here, remember that the first thing you can do is to change and, and uh, manipulate a little bit of the packets per second here in the burst size. But before you do that, make sure that you open a case and that uh, there's a good traffic analysis made on the switch. The, and the result of that analysis might show that the number of delay requests that you're receiving on the CPU of this device is too high. And that is what is causing the packets being dropped. And um, if you have that problem, the only solution today is to split all the sinks connected to this particular source uh, into um, or to take some of those uh, sinks and connect them to a different source. So you may need more boundary clocks on that network. When we get to the peer-to-peer um, -peer delay mechanism, we will be able to reduce the chances of having packets dropped in the traffic to the CPU of this device of the class PTP uh, to a, a very to the very minimum. So that is the best way to make sure that you have a healthy boundary clock. Just from time to time, monitor this package dropped in this class. How do you optimize a transparent clock? And the key here is QoS. The PTP event messages are marked by the sources in general, most um, grand source clocks in the market and our 8360s and 6300 switches, when they work in boundary clock mode, they uh, mark the packets, the, the event messages with a DSCP of 48. And that's what we're showing here. So if you have a transparent clock connected to these sources, then it is important that you trust the SCP or at least if you don't trust the SCP that you create a policy that will take these uh, packets to their, uh, you know, the highest priority possible in your network. This applies to transparent clocks, but also remember if you have non-PTP switches in the path of PTP traffic, then this is also a good thing to do because you will take those packets that are not being recognized by that device 
and you will uh, give them the highest priority possible. So PTP traffic will have a low delay and also a very low jitter. With that, we have the two uh, most important PTP optimization uh, processes that you can, or methods that you can implement. Now let's take a look at an update that was um, done with the 10.10 .10 release of CX. In the past, PTP was not supported on splitter or breakout cables, and now it is. Let's see the details. So in general, you will find these uh, splitter or breakout or hydra cables uh, to be used on 8360 switches. And uh, suppose that you have that an 8360 switch working as a boundary clock, and um, you want you have a port that can be the source, and you have a stack of 6300 switches or many different 6300 switches that are not a stack connected to a uh, intransparent clock mode connected to the 8360. In that case, it is very simple. What you do is you split the interface of that port in particular, here in this case, port eight, as you can see, this is port eight, and you split it. And now you select each one of the, the different interfaces on that split port, like in this case, one slash one slash eight, column one, and you enable PTP on that port. If you want, you can also enable the clock source only mode on that um, sub interface or you know a split interface to be more precise. Uh, one important note is that PTP is not supported today on layer three sub interfaces. It uh, will be in the future. Now, if you are using these um, splitter cables, breakout cables, uh, hydro cables. Here's a list of the ones that we support for that purpose on the 8360. So you have the SKUs here, you have uh, their description, and of course you have some DAC cables, uh, some um, active optical cables or AOCs. And in particular, if you're using the last two here, the 845420-B21 or the 24-B21, if you connect the 6300s at the other end, these are the models that will support connecting using AOCs to these devices. So if you are using any one of these two SFP28 AOCs, the seven meter and the 15 meter AOC, the only uh, devices that support the other end of that split are these three uh, models. So the uh, 6300M 24 port SFP plus uh, or the 10 gig model of the 6300, the 48 gig for SFP 56 and the 48 gig SFP uh, for SFP 56 with uh, power to port uh, airflow. So basically, you can see here that these are not PoE enabled devices. Now we will run a quick demo of PTP in a very simple environment. As you can see on the left side, we have an Axia traffic analyzer. The traffic analyzer, we have two ports on it that are connected to our PTP network. The first port at the top is behaving as the grand source, and it will be on an IP of 100.1.0.2, and its default gateway will be the boundary clock, an 8360 switch um, that has a dot one IP address on port five, which is the one connected to that port on the Axia. The boundary clock or the 8360 is routing between that link and a VLAN 1001, and um, that VLAN is uh, configured on port one slash one slash four, 
and the IP address of that vegan interface is 101.1.0.1. And that IP address is actually the default gateway for the ordinary clock, which is the second port on the XCI analyzer, and that has a um, port three on that same VLAN with an address that ends in dot two. So in between the boundary clock and the ordinary clock, we have a 6300M switch that is a transparent clock. So let's take a look at that. First of all, here we have our two switches. On the left, we have the 8360, and on the right, we have the 6300. As you can see in the PTP profile, both are running the default profile in the almost default configuration. So we have enabled the profile. Uh, we have selected the two-step clock. Uh, transport is IPv4, and the mode of the 60 or uh, the 8360 is boundary. And then on the interfaces, we have port one that is pointing down to the transparent clock as a clock short only port, and the port five that is connected to the XCL device, the actual grand source clock is uh, configured with just PTP enabled. This is the basic configuration that we need in this case. On the 6300, the configuration for PTP is even simpler. We have a PTP profile of um, you know, the 1588 V2 default profile that is enabled. Uh, again, look at the clock step. Here is one step, and this is the only option we have on this device. And um, on the boundary clock, we're using two step. So don't worry, the uh, this will work. So the one step clock step in the transparent clock doesn't matter much, and the one that will um, be prevalent will be the one on the boundary clock because this is the same parameter that we will define on our grand source clock and the ordinary clock in our XL device. So same transport protocol, IPv4, more transparent, end-to-end. -end. Remember, in both cases, we have end-to-end -end delay um, mechanism. And with that, the only thing that we see here is that we haven't configured any ports on the 6300. So, Let's go back to our um, graphic here, and we'll see that we need to enable PTP on ports 27 and 1. So let's do that. Config interface 1 slash 1 slash 1, comma 1 slash 1 slash 27. So run current. Let's see what we have. Both um, we have a problem with. The interface on port 27, it's not on the right VLAN. So let's do VLAN access uh, 101. And uh, let's enable PTP on these two ports. So now we have all the configurations, the minimum ne configurations necessary. Uh, we are using, as you can see, the transport protocol is IPv4, and because we didn't add any uh, PTP peers on any in the configuration of the boundary clock, that means that we're using multicast. So uh, do we need multicast configuration here? We actually do not because the, the other device is actually a... Um, is in layer two, so it will just be forwarding all the uh, multicast traffic that comes on this particular VLAN 101. So with that said, let's start looking at the XL device. Here we have the first port, port one, is actually running now with IP. Its IP address is 100.1.0.2, so let's ping that from the uh, boundary clock mode. Let's see if we can reach the source, the grand source. And so ping 100.1.0.2. And yes, we have that communication. 
let's see if we can reach the ordinary clock across the 6300. And we also have that connectivity. So from the um, IPv4 point of view, we're good to go um, because we're using the boundary clock is connected uh, to both the source and the destination uh, without any routing in between. We don't need any multicast um, configuration here. So let's go to the PTP traffic. And you see here, let's look at the top. Here, what we used to call the clock source is called the master clock. And so we will have the master clock and slave clocks as what we in Aruba call the source and the sync clocks or ports. So let's expand this. And you see that the clock roll, the first port here is the master. So let's get that one started. Let's take a look at a couple of things here. So the PTP state is disabled on both. Uh, the first port is in master mode and the second one is in slave mode. So this PTP2 port or Ethernet 002 port is the ordinary clock and the other one will become the grand source for this small network. Some other parameters that we have, uh, request response, the delay mechanism is okay. The, the profile 1588, which is fine. We're using the two-step mode. And as we said, multicast here, the typical parameters of the, um, the 1588v2 or the default profile, uh, the domain number zero, port number one, announce receipt timeout and all the other parameters here are the defaults, including the priority one. And you can also see the um, quality parameters of the, um, of the clock. So we're ready to get started. Let's click and start the source. So we're still not starting the um, the ordinary clock here at the bottom. So here, let's take a look at some statistics. Let's clear all statistics. Let's add new statistics here. So PTP, both the drill down and the, the per port. We'll apply them, I'll say okay. And now we have PTP drill down and PTP per port. So let's see the per port first. You see that now the, the session is up. There's one session up, which is right because we have only one source port. And here we have the number of messages sent. See the announced messages. These are the ones that will um, tell the 8360 switch that there's a source candidate on that port where this is connected, port five of that device. These are the sync messages sent, the follow-up messages. Remember, we have follow-up messages because we have here the two-step mode, right? Okay, let's take a look at the switch. What's going on? See, show PTP parent. And we see here that the parent is the one that we want. So this is the clock identity. Um, it is, let's see the port and we'll see on which port it is. And if you see the class, the accuracy, et cetera, this matches what we had on the Ixia on that particular port that was the source. So let's see show, PTP interface brief. And you see that port five is a sync so that's the right port. And because we have nothing else on that port, we're good. So we are looking at this port in particular, it's a sync. And we see that this is also the, um, the grand source identity. Forget these two bytes in the middle and look at the rest of the MAC. The rest will give you the MAC address. And that's what you have here, right? This is the MAC address. 
So let's take a look at that here. You see that um, the clock identity doesn't show up there, but let's do a PTP drill down. So let's take a look at the protocols on these two ports. Um, the status here on port on the first port is up. It's a master. It's the state is grandmaster. So remember, we call them sources, not masters. And the other one is slave. We call it sync and not slave. So here you see the port identity that we saw on, you see the 001101FFFE. That's what we were looking at here as the grand source clock identity. So we can keep looking at that there. Let's take a look at the events and let's see that the events are uh, the right ones and that the clock is in the right state. So first, before we do that, let's take a look at the clock itself. So you see here that the clock uh, is running with a PTP profile 1588v2. It's in boundary mode. The delay mechanism is end to end. The, the clock identity here, this is not the identity that we were looking before. This is the clock identity of this particular switch that we're looking at. Transport mechanism IPv4, two steps, domain zero, number of PTP ports two, remember ports five and one. And here's where you see the offset. So you see that the offset is 171 nanoseconds, but the mean delay is very small, is eight nanoseconds. You can keep looking at this and you see here, the offset is small. Now let's take a look at the TOPP statistics on our class PTP, sorry. And here you are. So no packets have been dropped. Of course, we are in a very low traffic situation here. So the basically that uh, CPU is only handling these you know, small number of PTP packets and not much more, not much routing or any other uh, thing happening here. So um, show event minus R minus D, PTP, D. And what we're looking at here is the, the events for this particular PTP daemon. So you see here the sequence of the, um, the calibration of our clock. So the first thing is that you look here, here's where everything started. So the port is in source mode, port five. Remember, we're looking at port five, which is the one that we're interested in because that's the one pointing to the grand source. So it starts, it receives the first announce. It, it receives the first announce. It still uh, behaves as, as its own parent. So remember this identity here, is its own identity that we saw above. So let's go up. And you see this clock identity is the one that we're seeing down here. So it's seeing himself or itself as its own grand source. Now it starts the process of calibrating. And before that, it the PTP clock is put in holdover state. That mainly means that the parent and the new parent is being selected. And so now two things happen almost at the same time. The new grand source clock is selected and the interface to that clock is uh, put in clock sync state. So port goes into clock sync. So those announced packets have been accepted and the new grant source parent is selected. So now you see that the MAC address or the uh, parent ID has changed to the ID of the XCR device. 
So now we go through the calibration process that PTP clock is in acquiring, in frequency lock, and finally in phase aligned state. So that is the whole process uh, from receiving the first announced packet to being ready and calibrated uh, with the source clock to start receiving and uh, synchronizing with the source clock. So that's the whole process on the 8360 for the boundary clock. Let's shrink this. And now we will take a look at the ordinary clock. So we will start the ordinary clock and there's not much to see here. So it says uncalibrated and now it's late. So it is has become a sync and it started synchronizing. So now we can go here to the PTP drill down and we can see the offset here. The maximum offset here in nanoseconds is too high. So let's do one thing because this went from uh, non-calibrated to calibrated and these statistics, mainly the maximum and minimum include the offsets when the device was not calibrated. So let's take a look at the reports, views, uh, configuration, where do we find the reset statistics? Um, we can go here, clear all statistics. So now we will take a look at the offset. You see the offset now makes more sense. It is around um, 35 nanoseconds, either plus or minus. The maximum is 67, the minimum is 28. And the path delay is a bit large, uh, but that's acceptable. It might be the right one. So, um, As you can see, this is being updated uh, normally. So let's take a look at the transparent clock. So show ETP interface brief. And you see that the only thing that it tells us is that it is running. Let's see show event uh, minus R minus E ETP daemon. And there's not much. The only thing that it tells us is that the ports are in running state and uh, it is enabled in, in running state. And that happens for uh, both ports, the 27 and one. That is the only thing that happens. There's not much more. The transparent uh, clock is adding the uh, resident time on all the, the packets um, and so the whole process is completed. We have our PTP network running and everything is ready. Remember, if the 6300 switch were um, in layer three mode, was routing between the boundary clock and the ordinary clocks, then we would have to config here the, um, the uh, PIM SM routing and IGMP. Also, we could start looking into uh, optimization processes like uh, QoS. With that, we have completed our demo. Thank you. Let's take a look at some troubleshooting um, tips for PTP in a CX environment. This is a quick checklist of the things that you might want to uh, verify in your travel treaty process. So the first thing is check that you have connectivity between the source and the sink. So you can, uh, you need ping and trace routes. Check uh, multicast routes and IGMP groups if you are using the, um, the IPv4 multicast um, transport option and when the source and the sync are on different subnets. So for example, when you have a layer three transparent clock in between. Uh, verify the source clock. You show PTP parent for that purpose. 
check the boundary clocks interfaces. So show PTP interfaces. You can use the brief option there and make sure that the source ports in the sync ports are the right ones. So that you haven't been, um, you know, one of your uh, source ports candidates has not become a sync and is receiving packets from an unwanted source. Finally, check the boundary clocks offset and uh, repeat that several times with show PTP clock. Check that the offset is within the uh, acceptable uh, uh, limits. And uh, that will be um, enforced by your, or suggested by the application that you have. Uh, for example, some audio um, systems might require a smaller offset than others. Uh, and video system might tolerate a, an offset that is slightly larger, etc. You can check that and um, you will have to do that in terms of your uh, PTP or your clock system, uh, basically on your ordinary clocks in what is acceptable for them. But check the clock offset if it goes above 100 nanoseconds and it keeps growing, then there's a problem in your network and you will have to start uh, and go deeper into the troubleshooting process. So one of the options in that case is that uh, to check the boundary clocks um, control plane uh, policy statistics for package drops, in particular for package drop on uh, the class PTP and see if you are dropping PTP packets that are destined to the CPU, then you have to uh, stop and check what is going on. If you have a so some too many uh, sinks connected to that source, you will either have to split them or in the future uh, change from end-to-end -end delay mechanism to a peer-to-peer -peer delay mechanism if what you have in between are transparent clocks. So between this particular device behaving as a source in its uh, sinks. Finally, check that the boundary clock state is phase aligned. So you can do that by um, checking the event lock and for in particular for the PTP daemon. So let's take a look at some of these steps. The first thing is that take a look at the interfaces. We said before, make sure that you have the right sync port and that you're not receiving packets from unwanted sources. Then um, check that you have the right PTP parent. So you're receiving synchronization information from the right source, not just the right through the right port, but also the right source. So make sure that your grand source clock identity is the right one. So that's the MAC address of your grand source clock. And of course, you can see there the, the details of that grand source clock, the class, the accuracy, and in general, the offset. Um, the offset will usually be zero for a grand source clock. And then the priority of that clock. When you look at the uh, phase state and the frequency state of your clock, you do the show event uh, minus R, so to see that in the reverse order, and minus D to see one of the demons, and in particular, the PTP demon. And if you take the last part, and this is what you do if you are looking at uh, a system that is not synchronizing properly or that is not selecting the right parents. Uh, here is where you see the process of going from a, um, a normal um, boundary clock in default state without any sources to uh, accepting a source. And uh, you go from new grant source parent here at the bottom. Let me see here. So you start, the first thing that you will see is that the new grant source has been selected or a parent. And here's the description of the parent. 
right? The quality, the the uh, MAC address, etc. And the priority is one and two. And remember, the quality are these three parameters. Uh, then you will see that one of the interfaces, or two of them, went from passive state to clock sync. And in this case, you see that in the second stage, uh, the port one stayed in clock sync state, and port two went back to clock source mode. That means that the parent has been selected. So these, the step one and two are what will show you that the right parent has been selected, but also that there was another source there that was a candidate that is now in a in standby mode. When you look at the port itself, the interface, from the PTP point of view, you will see that it is in source uh, mode or source state. But you, after you see this, you know that this is a backup uh, port for the um, for the PTP parent connection. Now the clock itself goes through several states. Once it has selected the parent, it starts the acquiring state, and this can be very fast. It can uh, last only a few seconds, and probably uh, not even a second. So it goes from acquiring state to frequency lock. And then finally, once the frequencies are synchronized, it will synchronize the phases. So this is when you get to the PTP clock in phase aligned state, that means that your this um, boundary clock is ready to be synchronized um, with its source. The source could be a grand source clock or another boundary clock higher up in the hierarchy of your network. So one thing that I didn't mention is that when you get to this point, the clock is calibrated and it's ready to stay closely in sync with its source. So when we get to this point in which it is phased aligned, we say that the clock is calibrated. So this is the calibration process for the clock. So, um, you can see here some of the things that you might want to take a look at when you look at the uh, troubleshooting. And one of the things that we recommend is that you look at the offset from the source clock. So do show PTP clock and check the offset. You can also check the mean delay. If any one of these parameters grows beyond 100 nanoseconds, so you see that you have more than three significant digits here on the right, then uh, you might be in trouble and you may want to keep um, digging into what the problem might be. So it could be like we saw in the previous slide that the, the calibration is not finalized or that there is any other issues like problems with the CPU and the COPP uh, discarding some packets. So remember, the offset is the amount of the deviation between this clock and its source, its parent clock. Here you can look at the interfaces, the full display, and uh, there's nothing very interesting here except for the port identity, uh, the clock the, the mode that it is running as a clock source in this case could also be a sync if it's receiving packets. Um, what is the delay mechanism that is configured here? Um, the announced, received, sync, uh, interval, and sync timeout, uh, and the delay request interval. Remember, these all these parameters are the ones that are selected via the profile. And finally, of course, the if this is this port is part of it. so in this case this is a link aggregation group so we have a primary port and a secondary port from the PTP point of view and that's what we're looking at down here. Remember also what we already mentioned about uh, the um, control plane 
policy statistics and especially the package dropped. And remember, we must monitor this parameter if we are seeing, for example, that there is a big offset um, that keeps growing in our uh, boundary clock. With that, we have concluded our PTP presentation. Thank you. And uh, I hope this was helpful for you.